Today we talk about pitching skills and I wanted to kick off with a video that hopefully clarifies why it is essential to make sure you train yourself for, for pitching in addition to writing that great screenplay. As long as I just write good scripts, then I'm good. And, and sadly for, you know, 95% of writers out here, even working writers, that the just writing a, a great, just being great at your individual craft isn't enough. And, you know, unless you're one of like the top A-list, you know, number one person in, 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 in the town or the top 10 writers in the town, everybody's trying to figure out how do I stop going from paycheck to paycheck? How do I stop? Because even, even if you're like A-list, you're still going paycheck to paycheck. There's always periods of uncertainty. There's always periods where, where the, the new up and comers are in there and things start to wind down a little bit and you got to get there and hustle. They may be big paychecks to big paychecks, but there's a stress and a pressure that is just around this industry that if you don't start thinking outside of the paradigm, you, it just, it'll, it, it'll wear you down after a while. And, uh, and so, so the, the biggest advice I could get is just get out there and look at all the tools that uh, you have at your disposal and figure out how to use all of them in the best way, how to, how to look at models that have been there for a hundred years and say, say, how do I, incrementally def, uh, deviate from that? How can, I, how can I operate within it, but at the same time put pressure on it from the outside to start to change it? How can I establish myself and my brand as a writer and a filmmaker uh, as, as a different brand than all these other 8 million people that are trying to do the exact same thing as me? How do I do all those things? And it, so that it's not always, how do I just write the better script? Because it's very difficult to write the better script. <laughs> Obviously, there are pitches or you can do a pitch to a person you already know. But in today's class, we will focus on preparing for that first time pitch. Your timing is everything. And at various stages of this process, timing is uh, essential. We'll talk about the infamous 25 words or less. And I won't be the only one talking about that. The hook, critical element of your pitch. I'm going to go over what could be the various content elements in your pitch. And mindset is also incredibly important. We'll talk about a few aspects of mindset as well. And in the preparations you need to do. And at the end of today's class, I have a video. It's a quite an old video. The picture, uh, the, the, yeah, the picture quality is not, not brilliant, but my students keep asking for this video because it is it's very powerful. Tony Gilroy gives instant feedback to a number of pitches. Most of those pitches are primarily story-driven. And we'll see that that's not, not necessarily the way you should always pitch. In, in the case of this video, that was the setup. So um, we'll have a look at that at the end of today's class. So... That first time pitch, there's no real word for that experience. Um, uh, pitch doesn't really cover it. There's another word that uh, fits better, I think, when you pitch for the first time to a person you've never met before. Now, the, the type of pitch uh, that we're going to be focusing on today is the meeting with a person one has not previously met, arranged with a view to the development of a professional relationship. I didn't come up with that definition. I took it from here and just changed a few words. So essentially, the type of pitch we're talking about today is like a blind date or even a speed date. It's not just your, your average date, but it has a lot in common with that date. And just like dating, it is critical to get your timing right. If you don't, you might find yourself um, in a situation of utter embarrassment. What? You want to hear my pitch? Go away, goddammit. You know, I'm just trying to do something. Hey, thanks a lot, buddy. Cool. Okay, there's a serial killer, right? Well, no, wait. And he's being hunted by a cop. And he's taunting the cop, right? Sending clues who his next victim is. He's already holding her hostage in his creepy basement. So the cop gets obsessed with figuring out her identity and in the process falls in love with her, even though he's never even met her. She becomes like, like 
like the unattainable, like, like the Holy Grail. It's a little obvious, don't you think? Okay, but here's the twist. We find out that, that the killer really suffers from multiple personality disorder, right? See, he's, he's actually really the cop and the girl. All of them are him. Isn't that fucked up? The only idea more overused in serial killers is multiple personality. On top of that, you explore the notion that cop and criminal are really two aspects of the same person. See every cop movie ever made for other examples of this. Mom called it psychologically taught. The other thing is, there's no way to write this. Did you consider that? I mean, how, how could you have somebody held prisoner in a basement and, and working in a police station at the same time? Trick photography. Okay, that's not what I'm asking. Listen closely. What I'm asking is, in the reality of this movie, where there's only one character, right? Okay? How could you... What, what exactly would... I agree with mom. Very taut. Sybil meets, I don't know, dressed to kill. So that's from Adaptation. You see Nicolas Cage playing... Donald Kaufman, who's pitching, and Jim Kaufman, um, Charlie Kaufman, brother, who is listening to the pitch. Now, I love the scene, I love the movie, but it's really interesting what's going on here often happens in pitches with a big difference that Charlie Kaufman in this scene gives his instant, honest response, where that doesn't usually happen. And then Donald is trying to argue his point, which does often happen, but which shouldn't happen. Also amusing is the fact that Donald had previously pitched this to mom and mom liked it. And now he's pitching it to his brother. Now his brother happens to be Charlie Kaufman in the film. So don't pitch to your family. The real pitches are industry pitches. And later today, I'll recommend that when you prepare, when you practice for a high stakes pitch, you actually do a practice pitch in the real world with real industry people. The next example comes from my absolute favorite film about the movie industry, and that's Bowfinger, with Steve Martin and in the scene that you're going to watch also with Robert Downey Jr. Now, Steve Martin went about it a little bit more strategically. His timing is slightly better than the one that we just saw with Donald Kaufman. And he booked a table next to the table where he knows this um, high-powered industry executive uh, often dines. It's a scene that I've played many times. It's also a scene that uh, YouTube blocked yesterday, which made the recording of yesterday's session invisible. But we can deal with that. I can still play it, and you can still enjoy it. Bobby Bowfinger, played by Steve Martin in the eponymous movie Bowfinger. I love that movie. It has... Eddie Murphy's best performance in his career as Kid Ramsey. He, it also has uh, um, uh, Eddie Murphy's second best performance in his career as the brother, the twin brother of Kid Ramsey. So if you haven't already seen that film, definitely check it out, Bowfinger. So what we see in this particular scene, is not really a pitch. It's a, it's a smart way of getting the script on the desk of an industry pro. And um, yeah, so... He did that here by booking a table uh, in a restaurant where he knows that this industry exec often dines. And in this case, it worked. So the, the deal, it, it looked as if the deal was clinched right there and then. That's probably the most implausible part of the whole scene. However, I will show you a, a video with an anecdote about just that. So it does happen in the industry, uh, no matter how unlikely it may be. Um, I want to say welcome to a few people that have arrived after we started. Welcome to Dan and um, Paul. So moving forward, that was you just saw my, my favorite uh, clip from my favorite movie about the industry. Um, let's go to my second favorite movie about the industry. That's Robert Altman's drama, um, The Player from 1992. And in the scene that we're going to watch, you will see Richard E. Grant performing a pitch and um, I think that that's a, an even better example because there's a lot of things he does right. Except again, that one thing, the timing of this pitch is not uh, particularly well uh, chosen. I really am meeting somebody. There's no way I can hear a pitch right now. You'll have to call me tomorrow. No, I can't do it tomorrow. I've got a meeting at Paramount in the morning. i got a meeting at Universal 2 well, in the morning. Right. And if you don't hear it now, 
you're gonna lose it. Well, then I lose it, all right? It'll take 20 seconds. When your friend gets here, whoever... What friend? What are you what? talking about? Who? Who are you gonna meet here? 25 words or less. Absolutely. Talk about it. No, you sit here talking. Okay. Go. District attorney is at a moral crossroads. Oh, Jesus Christ. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, we open outside the largest penitentiary in California. It's night. It's raining. A limousine comes in through the front gate, past a tight knot of demonstrators right? holding a candlelight vigil. The candles under the umbrellas make them glow like Japanese lanterns. That's nice. I haven't seen that before. That's good. A lone demonstrator, a black woman, steps in front of the limousine. The lights illuminate her like a spirit. Her eyes fix upon those of the sole passenger. The moment is devastating between them. He's the DA, she's the mother of the person that's being executed. You're good. See, I told you, he's good. Go on. Okay. The DA believes in the death penalty, and the execution is a hard case, black, 19, and definitely guilty. We're in the greatest democracy in the world, and 36% of the people on death row are black. Poor, disadvantaged, more, more. black. And he swears that the next person he sees to die is going to be smart, rich, and white. You, me, well. Oh, what a hook, huh? Beauty hook. Cut to the chase, Tom. Okay, okay, okay. Cut from the DA to an upmarket suburban neighborhood. A couple have a fight. He leaves in a fit, gets in a car. It's a same rainy night. The car spins out on a road, goes into a ravine. The body is swept away. Now, when the police examine the car, they find the brakes have been tampered with. It's murder. And the DA decides to go for the big one. He's going to put the wife in the gas chamber. But the DA falls in love with the wife. But of course he falls in love with the wife. But he puts her in the gas chamber anyway. Then he finds out the husband is alive, that he faked his death. The DA breaks into the prison, runs down death row. But he gets there too late. The gas pellets have been dropped. She's dead. I tell you, there's not a dry eye in the house. She's dead? She's dead. She's dead. Because that's the reality. The innocent die. Who's the DA? Ah, no one. No one? No stars on this project. We're going out on a limb on this one. You, you know, uh, like unknown stage actors or maybe somebody English, like what's his name? Mm -hmm. Why? 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 Because this story is just too damned important to risk being overwhelmed by personality. Yeah, that's fine for action pictures, but this is special. We want real people here. We don't want people coming with any preconceived notions. We want them to see a district attorney. Bruce Willis. No, not Bruce Willis, not Kevin Costner. This is an innocent woman fighting for her life. Julia Roberts. If we can get her. Of course we can get her. If I'm perfectly honest, if I think about this, this isn't even an American film. It's not. No, no. There are no stars, no pat happy endings, no Schwarzenegger, no stick-ups, no, no terrorists. This is a tough story, a tragedy, in which an innocent woman dies. Why? Because that happens. Habeas corpus. That's what we're calling it. Produce the corpse. What do you say, yes or no? That pitch was more than 25 words. Yeah, Come but on. it's brilliant. What's the verdict, Griffin? 25 words or less, the infamous 25 words or less. There's a lot of truth in this scene. And I know we, you know, it, it's, uh, it looks like we're just watching movies here instead of learning about pitching. But all these scenes were written from the experience of a lot of pitching. Because any filmmaker who makes it to the point where these people made it and talking about, you know, Altman and, and, and the writer uh, Tolkien who wrote uh, the, the original screenplay and the book that the film was based on, not that Tolkien by the way. Um, we'll have a few more Hollywood pitch examples and I believe they all come from that, that, that experience and, and the truth. Um, also brilliant in this scene was Dean Stockwell who played the partner of Richard E. Grant and that in itself is an interesting learning point because sometimes dual pitches or team pitches are more um, impressive, they're more convincing than solo pitches. When you have a team behind a project, in some way it instills confidence. Usually you would expect that the, the partners are a little bit more on the same wavelength than you can see here. Um, did you notice how the, the producer asked questions 
And one of the questions was why? And that's, that's definitely one that if you don't already address it in your pitch, then you need to be prepared for that. Um, th there was a sense that these two know the industry up to the point where Richard E. Grant obviously starts to argue that it may not be uh, an American film, which obviously goes directly against the interests of the studio. And that's critical that you know what those interests are, what, the, what uh, sort of material they produce. Also mentioned at some point was the hook. And the hook is critically important. If you're really trying to sell rather than introducing yourself and establishing a relationship, which should be the first in intention of this type of pitch. But if you really want to sell, then you must have a project with a very clear, strong hook that works. And the uh, anecdote that I'm going to show you in a minute uh, from Bill Lawrence, who created Scrubs, will indicate that the hook can actually clinch the deal during the meeting. So here's Bill Lawrence telling that story. So I was in with the head of my studio, with uh, Jeff Ingold was with me, and he wanted to know what I was working on. And uh, I hadn't really worked it out yet, but I was talking with the studio head and uh, uh, pitching him through the idea, and he was grinding me, as he should, you know, but he was, you know, I don't think this is universal enough for network TV. Is this character relatable? Who's the hero? Who are we gonna like? And he's just pounding me on it. And uh, at the end uh, of an hour, he said, uh, um, you know, maybe there's something here, but you're not there yet, right? And I'm like, oh, gosh. And we're walking out, and Jeff Ingold takes out of his back pocket a book called Undateable. And the book Undateable was just a book uh, that says Undateable in the front, and then it has 150 pictures of guys that are undateable. So it's like fanny pack guy. Right. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know what I mean? Goatee guy. Right? And he takes that book out and he throws it to the studio head. And he's like, you see this book? And the studio head picks it up and he goes, undateable. It's a great title. He goes, fanny pack guy. <laughs> Goatee guy. I hate that guy. Yeah, we'll make this. And that was it. And I'm like, I almost lost my mind because they're both friends of mine. I'm like, I've been in here talking to you for an hour about a personal show. Right. You just, that just happened in eight seconds. I'm like, I don't even know what undateable is about. He's like, go figure it out. It's a good title. It's funny. And that shows on TV now. An example of the hook that clinches the deal. You have to be very careful because hooks don't always work. So make sure that the hook that you think is the, the one thing that's going to be appealing to your audience, it actually works. If it misfires, um, it can misfire very, very quickly and very badly. And then you need to be quick on your feet and, and, and be flexible and respond to that. Um, learning about pitching and learning about television, you can do from the best. And here are a few of the best. I think I can sum up the show for you with one word. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing? Nothing. What does that mean? The show is about nothing. Well, it's, it's not about nothing. No, it's about nothing. Well, maybe in philosophy, but even nothing is something. Mr. Dalrymple, your niece is on the phone. I'll call back. Uh, D-A-L-R-I-M-P-E-L. Not even close. <laughs> So in this scene, Jerry got it very quickly that the hook wasn't working and he wanted to save the meeting. George didn't get it and he just kept pushing his agenda and that didn't work. When this happens, you have to be you know, humble and, and take your loss and move on. Um, now, the hook is a critical, important part of your pitch. What else needs to be in there? So let's have a look at other elements, other uh, parts of the content that you may include in your pitch. So first of all, you can't really go in and immediately t start telling the story. There's people who have tried that, um, doesn't work. You need an icebreaker, a bit of small talk, maybe an introduction of yourself uh, if the person you're meeting with isn't already familiar with who you are and what you do. As part of that introduction, you might also build a connection with the work that you're going to present. So th there may well be a natural a link between you and your project, and this is the right time to do that. And then you get to the basics. That's where you start talking about the project itself in terms of this, uh, the, base, the basic the title, if you have one, if, if it's a good one, the format, is it TV, is it film, is it 30 minutes, is it an hour, the genre, and you can also include the hook here. Antecedents help you 
position, the vibe, the tone, the style of the work. And once we kind of know the realm in which you're operating, it's much easier to understand what follows when you're going to talk about the plot and the characters. So I think all these these five points, it's important that you give them before you start telling the story because they really create the framework within which your audience is going to interpret that story. And then only as point six, we get to the story, which is character, plot, and theme. You may have a team behind you, and then this may be the, the point where you're going to talk about them. Um, only bring them up if they provide you leverage, if they're people with a certain name or experience, or if they are linked to the project, if it is a biographical piece, if you have the support of the person that uh, this is about, that would help as well. Audience is a tricky one. A lot of people will encourage you to very clearly state the audience that you're working for, but you're not a marketeer and the people you're pitching to are the experts. They know their audience. It's really up to them to define it. Don't, don't, don't go into specifics because you, you may make uh, mistakes that distract during the pitch. So I think talking about an op- audience is an, is an optional thing. If you've done your research, you know roughly what the company that you're pitching to produces, then you should be roughly in the ballpark. So don't go too specific without having done your homework. You've already indicated why you are a good fit for this project, why you should be telling this story. Now is maybe the time to explain why you think that you should be working with the person you're pitching to and, and why they're a good fit too. And then finally, there's one that at the most important pitch I ever did to an Oscar winner, multiple Oscar winner, who could essentially uh, help greenlight the project that we were working on, we forgot about that final point. And the final point is the call to action. What do you want from the people you're pitching to? Our pitch was a monster movie and we were pitching to um, Sir Richard Taylor at Weta Workshop in uh, Wellington right after they'd collected all these Oscars with the Lord of the Rings trilogy. And um, at the end of the pitch, Richard was impressed and he loved it and he wanted to be part of it. But there was this silence and then he said, so what exactly do you want from us? And we hadn't thought it through. Now, because Richard really liked the project, he started brainstorming himself. He said what they could offer. And and he, at the time, he was very generous. Unfortunately, for many, many reasons, the, the project didn't happen, although we, we created some good momentum in, in that pitch. And that pitch was definitely um, an, an incredibly... Uh, positive experience. Now, what is really important and maybe the most important thing when you're pitching for the first time and pitching for the first time to this particular person is the mindset. So what is your intention? What's the attitude uh, that you approach this this person with? And a lot of pitches, if you listen to pitches on, uh, on uh, YouTube or in the, in the real world, People seem really desperate to get their message across and to make sure that the other side gets what they want, rather uh, what the pitcher wants, rather than um, communicating or coming to a conversation. So this is what many pitches feel like, and that's not how it works. So rather than being a megaphone, I always say, try to be a magnet. Try to create uh, uh, an atmosphere where the other party is intrigued and they want to know more from you and they start talking and they start asking questions. So in essence, you've got to do the opposite. And that obviously brings us back to our greatest teachers. Yes, I will do the opposite. I used to sit here and do nothing and regret it for the rest of the day. So now I will do the opposite and I will do something. Many of us have gone into these pitch meetings with the, the, the vibe, the energy of getting this stuff over to the other party. And that may feel a bit overwhelming. So you've got to do the opposite. Create an atmosphere in which uh, conversation is possible, and particularly when you meet for the first time. That is that's critically important. All right, we're half, half an hour into today's masterclass, and I wanted to see how you are all going. And um, yeah, whether there's anything you'd like to ask or maybe you'd like to um, add some of your experience with pitching. Would anyone like to? Yes, Barbara. Um, 
see if you, yeah, perfect. We can hear you. Hi, I have a question. What are yeah. the various options that you can pitch for? What exactly is, you know, the different levels? Is it always just to get your project read? Is that the goal of the pitch? Or could it be other, depending on who you're pitched to? What, what can we aim for, I suppose? Yeah, that's a really good question because obviously that comes back to the call to action. What can you realistically ask the party that you're pitching to? It will depend on the circumstances. Um, often events are organized where the purpose is to get new ideas, fresh ideas to the attendants. And uh, in that case, you would certainly aim for them to request your screenplay. I think that is probably the most common uh, CTA call to action in a pitching situation in our industry is to get people to read your script. Even that may be asking too much initially, if particularly if there's no relationship yet. So maybe it's about getting them to read the synopsis or a, a treatment. But ultimately, they will have to read the script. And that's one of the things that I learned by doing the opposite. When with my partners in the story shop, we pitched to Netflix, we, we started with questions. And uh, although I was hesitant because it was like, yeah, I know I've learned and, and I've got to, you know, walk to talk. And, and so it felt a little bit uncomfortable that we were asking questions. But very quickly, we figured out a lot of stuff that obviously other people that had pitched to them didn't know or, or uh, had um, overlooked. And one of my early questions was, so what other sort of projects are you being pitched from Australia? And they said, well, we get a lot of questions for endorsements so, so people can get government funding. And we don't do that. So right there, they eliminated a whole lot of people uh, that, that were approaching them. So that, they don't do that, very clear. Now, we were still in development with our project. At some point, they said, they said very clearly, we are only interested if there is a screenplay. And that, for us, made it easy. So the conversation, we ended that conversation ourselves early rather than letting them feel like, oh, we're wasting our time because they don't have a script. So we, we played it professionally and, and you know, didn't want to waste their time. So ask the questions, find out what it is that they want. And, and most likely they will want to see scripts, but maybe they are, they're after others. Maybe they're after writers to, to join their existing projects. Um, and that may not be immediately the, the purpose or the intention of the pitch, but that could be a, 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 you know, a, a side effect. That could be an outcome of your pitch that you hadn't uh, planned. But by asking questions, all those things may come out. So it depends. It depends on the situation. Any other questions or thoughts, experiences, your own experiences with, with pitching? I'm not quite sure how to signal you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, Roshan. Okay. So for a logline for a TV series, how how does that work? Because I have a you have a plot for let's say each series, like say I'm doing multiple series, but but the same subject sort of. So I've got an overarching plot, and I've got inside plots inside the series. And, and so how do I pitch? What do I pitch the yeah. overarching? Yeah. Very, very good question. Pitching for TV, pitching for film is very different. And it goes a little bit beyond what this particular masterclass is about. But I'll try and answer as, uh, as best as I can. First of all, you mentioned logline. Um, and I should have mentioned this when we were talking about the 25 words or less. That refers to log lines. There are people, there are teachers in Hollywood that say never include the log line in your pitch. And I thought that was bizarre because isn't the log line the most condensed, the most uh, you know, time effective way of getting your story across? And it may well be, but from my own experience, when I listen to people pitching log lines, I need to ask them to read it to me two, three times because a log line is so incredibly dense that my brain doesn't work fast enough to process those 25 words and see the, the immediate story. I mean, if I'm really fresh and sharp and you know, awake, then yes, maybe, but not when you've heard 10 before. So that's probably why in a, in, in a pitching situation, you want to give it more time so people can actually process it. Now, the difference between television and film. For film, there's a very clear 
uh, format for Logline. And, and, and yeah, if you don't know what that is, check out Logline it, logline.it. That's the website I launched about eight years ago, focusing specifically on Loglines. And it's actually not that hard to write a really effective Logline for a film. For television, you are absolutely right. There are shows where you can write beautiful log lines for the individual episodes, but it's sheer impossible for the whole show because television is often not plot-driven, it's character-driven. So you you can't find a, a, an event, a trigger event or a catalyst or an inciting incident. In, in some shows, some shows have that, but many shows don't. So you need to come up with a blurb, a concept, a hook that goes beyond that logline and that is incredibly character focused. When you pitch a show, the most important thing for television is that when you describe your core characters, about five, it is clear that there will be conflict between each of those. Think about your favorite shows. All the lead characters are likely in conflict with one another in some way or other. Um, so yes, television is very different, and I think in order to pitch for television, you need to study the the, the, uh, the specifics. So basically, I understand what you're saying, and it's very you've simplified it massively for me. Thank Good, you. no worries. Thank you. For someone like me who has virtually no contacts in the industry and has had no luck in contacting anyone, um, is there a viable pitching service online or in some other medium that will help. I mean, I've tried the tip, but uh, is there another way? I'm never likely to be sitting in front of a TV, sorry, a film director. Yeah, that's going to be the subject of a future masterclass when we talk a bit more broadly about script marketing. But again, the, the quick answer is, you need to establish connections somehow and they need to be personal. Ultimately, they need to be personal connections. And you can do that by doing research into projects that you like and gradually build leverage. Um, um, for instance, how did we get to the pitch in, in Wellington? We were, we were invited to go pitch at the office of uh, Richard Taylor. That was 15 years ago. How do we do that? We approached him at an event and we would, you know, introduce ourselves and talked about the project that we were talking about, which, which was right up their alley. They just loved the, the general concept of what we'd done. And we'd already created a short film. And uh, uh, Rosemary knows what we're talking about here, because I think you, you saw that. And um, so, we, um, so, so Richard got excited about that short film. And he said, why don't you come and show it to us in Wellington, to the, to the crew? And he basically opened uh, Peter Jackson's brand new cinema, the Camperdown Theatre, for us to show that film. Uh, they were working, I think they were working on, on The Hobbit at the time. Uh, no, they were working on, um, doesn't matter. And, and he closed down the studio and then showed the film. And they were so excited about that short film that he said, when, whenever you have anything, make sure you come to us to pitch it. And we did that. A year later, we flew back to Wellington and did the pitch. And that's when he made us an offer. The afternoon, we were sitting with Peter Jackson's lawyer thinking about and talking about financing options because Richard taught, uh, put us in touch. So it's, it's about always gaining leverage. Go from one small piece of leverage to another to another. Always make sure that, look at what you've got and then build on that. In terms of practical pitching opportunities online, there were never many of those because people like to see you in the real world because they want to work with you, so they want to see how you operate and you know behave in the real world. Now, thanks to the pandemic, a lot of this has moved online and the opportunities will open up uh, exponentially in terms of pitching online. There used to be, and there probably still is, um, a website called Virtual Pitch Fest. That is an ongoing uh, forum where you can pitch online. I'm involved, as you know, Leon, with the uh, uh, Screen, AC, ACT, Screen Camera um, uh, Accelerator pod in uh, the ACT. And there we uh, train people up to, to pitch on the final day of the program and they will be able to pitch to high-level industry executives. That used to be in person this year for the first time that is online and we are pretty confident that that format of an online training program w leading to a pitching opportunity will survive the pandemic because people like it, that they don't have to travel there. Both participants and industry executives, they like that they can do it from their home. So those opportunities will continue to exist. 
It's about finding out which ones are suitable to your project and then also try and match your project with the right people to pitch to. So do the research who has done projects that are similar to yours and try to get in front of those people. So th there are a number of opportunities. And as you see, it changes all the time. The situation today is very different from what it was a year ago, even you know nine months ago. It's like, hi, it's nice to meet you. So here's the idea for the show. And nine times out of 10, what I tell people going in, I'm like, first of all, shut up. Mm -hmm. And then second of all, ask questions. Like before you say a word about what your show is or what your mm -hmm. idea is, ask them what they're doing. Find out about the Tony Braxton night. Find out about what they're doing and then adapt your pitch to what they're saying. Because at the end of the day, they are not buying what they want. They're buying what their audience wants and they know their audience. They're looking at analytics like weekly, daily. They know who their audience is. They know what the breakdowns are within the shows. Learn that. Like you will know so much more about what you are actually supposed to say in that meeting from them than you ever will from your agent or your manager or your lawyer or your whatever, meditation counselor, whoever you're talking to mm. before you go into the pitch. I wish that was a joke, by the way. Um, <laughs> that's that's <clears throat> that, that if you go in and you actually ask questions and you learn what the network is looking for and what their bosses are looking for, then you can do it. I can't tell you the number of shows we have where someone said like, blah, 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 blah. Oh, and David Zaslov said this thing in, in a meeting yesterday. And I stopped my pitch cold and was like, what was the full context of what David Zaslov said? Because honestly, everything I've said is irrelevant if he said that he wants blue and I'm pitching red. And that that to me is something that it it's born out of experience, but really it's not that complicated. All you have to do is put a question mark at your first three sentences out of your mouth in a pitch and your pitch will go a lot smoother. It's a mindset. That's what it is. What else can you say about mindset other than do the opposite? Really important, find common ground. You will have done your research, but even in the conversation, you will find things to talk about with, with your partner. And I, I say partner because I picture that I'm already collaborating with them. That works in terms of putting yourself at ease. Um, always think about the other person's interests because you're there to, to help make their next pitch meeting more interesting or, or more successful because they're going to have to pitch to their superiors and whatever you give them may or may not help them with that. So keep that in mind. Be passionate. Uh, be passionate but not desperate. A lot of us don't like it. We're writers. We're writers for a reason. We like the solitude and we may be introverted more than extroverted. But ultimately, you're going to have to do this more often. It is part of the career. As I always say, the screenwriter's career is built on three pillars. Story, script and sales. And pitching is an important part of the sales. During the pitch, you can use whatever makes you feel confident because confidence is really important. Some people have trouble memorizing large amounts of information, although I think you should own your entire project and be able to tell about every minute detail if asked about it. You can always bring memory aids or you can bring something to distract, to divert the attention. When I was pitching the um, monster, the creature film with my partner back in the days, we carried along a bust of our creature. We had, uh, our, um, my partner was also very skilled at, at um, design. He designed the creature and we were carrying that along. So that kind of diverted the attention and the nerves away from us and made it much easier to deliver our pitch. So use whatever makes you feel more confident during the pitching experience. I said before, Keep it brief, keep in control. You should determine when the pitch is over. You don't keep talking until the other person says, ah, you know, I've got to move, move. my next meeting's coming up. It's so much more professional when you, when you just wrap it up when everything's said. Um, and therefore, keep it brief, allow for questions, and then move on. At all time, use your knowledge about the industry and show interest, show your own passion there is there's obviously creative part as a business part, but you kind of need to love both and show your interest in both. At the end of the day, not every pitch can be uh, can be successful, and if early pitches are often not successful, you need to learn to deal with rejection. Many of you are already used to that um, on paper. The same happens in real life pitches. 
ultimately it is only a pitch. There'll be many more and whatever happened during this one you will have learned from and it can only make you stronger. And that will then lead to the preparations for the next pitch. And what are the things that you keep in, need to keep in mind as you prepare for your first and subsequent pitches? I mentioned it, the most important one, research the company or producer that you're pitching to. Prepare the pitch in a way that is visual. Remember Richard E. Grant, the clip from The Player? how he was describing the, the candles underneath the umbrellas and then Tim Robbins' resp- response to that. So he used an image, he used a powerful visual image in his pitch, but then immediately went back up to the higher level of the pitch and told the summary of the story. So you need to find that balance between visual and urgent in the moment, but then go back up to the bigger picture of your pitch. And that is all part of the preparation. Make sure it will be memorable. And then rehearse it. Rehearse it with real people, with real companies, not with your mom, not with your brother, unless your brother is Charlie Kaufman, of course. I would say don't rehearse on pitching day. That's from my own experience. Um, Rehearse a lot beforehand, but on the day you're going to pitch, if I go back into rehearsing mode, I get, uh, you know, I lose my confidence. So on pitching day, it's, it's about performing, delivering it. Prepare for that question, what else have you got? It means that as a professional, you're not working on just one project. You're an industry practitioner, which means you are constantly working on something. I heard from the writers of um, so a romantic film, um, um, I, f- I forgot the, the title, it's a, it's a big romance film for the last few years. They had at any given point, The Fault in Your Stars, that's the, that's the movie, Fault in Your Stars, at any point in time, do they have about a hundred projects in various stages of development? So this is not ideas. This is projects in various stages of development. One hundred, and some of them will never happen because other people are first. Uh, others, you know, lose their their uh, pizzazz. Always have something to answer that question. What else have you got? For me personally, I need to make sure I've got enough sleep. So that's part of the preparations. Dress casually, they say. Always make sure that it doesn't look like you need the money less than the person in front of you. That seems to be a Hollywood um, saying. Healthy food for energy. That was something advised to me. And um, yeah, protein. Eat proteins on, on the day. That seems to work. Manage the coffee situation. If you are a heavy coffee drinker, that may have an impact on how you feel. And finally, this is a post-pandemic thing because you won't be pitching any anytime soon at the premises of a company you haven't been to before. But once this whole thing is over, then um, if you're going to pitch at the company's premises, then go there beforehand. Check it out. That has multiple benefits. Um, I go from my own experience, again, most successful pitches were where I had visited the premises the day before. First of all, you know where it is. You won't lose time, won't waste time in trying to find where you need to go. But equally, you are familiarizing with yourself with the environment. I, I once did an audition for television when I had never worked for television before. And I felt it was quite intimidating. So I went to the TV studios beforehand as a visitor went inside and, and, you know, became familiar with the surroundings and that helped tremendously. When I did the audition, I got the job out of 11 uh, people who got it to that point who were invited to auditioning. And I was, uh, as far as I know, the only one who didn't have any television experience at the time. So, yeah, I, all these things are helping you in terms of mindset and confidence on the day. Let's go back to a Hollywood pitch. This is from a brilliant Billy Wilder movie, um, um, I was going to say Sunset Boulevard. Yeah, it is, it is Sunset Boulevard, early in the film. All right, Gillis, you've got five minutes. What's your story about? It's about a baseball player, a rookie shortstop that's batting 347. Uh-huh. Poor kid was once mixed up in a holdup, but he's trying to go straight. Uh-huh. Except there are a bunch of gamblers that won't let him. So they tell the poor kid he's got to throw the World Series or else, huh? More or less, except for the end, i got a gimmick that's real good. Uh-huh. You got a title? Base is loaded. There's a 40-page outline. Call Reader's Department. Find out what they have on bases loaded. They're pretty hot about it over 20th, except I think Xanax all wet. Can you see Ty Power as a shortstop? Mm. You got the best man for it right here in this lot, Alan Ladd. Be a good change of pace for Ladd. And there's another thing, it's pretty simple to shoot. Lots of outdoor stuff. I bet you could make the whole thing for under a million. <coughs> Excuse me. 
And there's a great little part for Bill Demers. One of the trainers, an old time player who got bean, goes out of his head sometimes. And the lady walking in is Betty Schaefer. We'll come back to Betty Schaefer in a minute. But so far, the pitch went fine. Gillis clearly knows his job. He knows the studio. He knows what the producer needs. He knows who is under contract with the studio. So he shows that he's concerned with the studio's success. And this is a conversation. Together, they're trying to work towards something that would ultimately be profitable for the studio. That's a perfect pitch. Now, obviously, from this situation, this is not a first-time pitch, but that's what you aim to achieve. So if you have this in mind, make sure that your first pitch meeting is about getting to the stage where you can behave and act like Gillis in the scene from Sunset Boulevard. So I said, so far, so good, but then Betty Schaefer walked in. One of the trainers, an old-time player who got bean, goes out of his head sometimes. Hello, Mr. Sheldrake. Hello. On that basis loaded, I covered it with a two-page synopsis. Thank you. But I wouldn't bother. What's wrong with it? It's from hunger. Nothing for lad? Well, it was just a rehash of something that wasn't very good to begin with. I'm sure you'll be glad to meet Mr. Gillis. He wrote it. This is Miss Kramer. The name is Schaefer. Betty Schaefer. Right now, I wish I could crawl in a hole and pull it in after me. If I could be of any help. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Gillis, but I just didn't think it was any good. I found it flat and trite. Exactly what kind of material do you recommend? James Joyce? Dostoevsky? I just think that pictures should say a little something. Oh, one of the message kids. Just a story won't do. You'd have turned down Gone with the Wind. No, that was me. I said, who wants to see a Civil War picture? So here's some honesty in the pitching situation. It doesn't happen very often, particularly when you're a newbie. It's unlikely that the person you're pitching to is going to open up and tell you why they don't like uh, the, the material because they don't want to go into an argument, which is what happens sadly in many cases. Many inexperienced people try to argue why they do certain things. That is not the thing to do at the, at the first pitch. Now, You've seen us a number of pitches. Now, what would be the perfect pitch? I'm going to show you a one-minute pitch from a writer um, who tells the story, just the story in one minute. So here in the, the scene we just watched, the, there were five minutes available, and five, three to five is pretty common, I'd say, in, in, even in formal situations. Now, um, the filmmaker, her name is Zach Schaefer, not related, I assume, um, to Paul or Betty. Zach Schaefer pitched her film and ultimately got it made. So she ended up being the writer-director of this film and it started with this one-minute pitch. Timer is a romantic comedy with a sci-fi twist. It's about a device that is implanted in your wrist that gives you a countdown to the moment that you meet your soulmate. But the catch is that in order for you to have a countdown, your soulmate, whoever and wherever he is, he also has a time has to have a timer implanted as well. So our heroine, her name is Una, she has the rare dilemma of a blank timer, which means that her soulmate hasn't had a timer implanted. So she goes around dating timerless guys with the hope that they'll get their timer implanted and that'll be her, her soulmate. And she's disappointed time and time again until one day she falls in love, well not one day, but she meets a man who she falls in love with and his timer is set to meet his soulmate in four months. So it's like, live for the moment, follow the timer, what to do? Something that's hard with pitching is you need to be really enthusiastic and be animated and believe in it. And you're, they're not obligated to give that back to you. Can you be too enthusiastic? Can you be too passionate? Well, I'll give you the answer in the final video of today's class. So hang around for that. Um, so yeah, in one minute she told the story. It was a fairly complex story, but we got it. So you need to be able to do that and then some, somehow muscle that into your pitch. I promised you the pitches to Tony Gilroy. Here we're listening to three brief pitches and his immediate feedback. And try to figure out what are the criteria, what, what are the elements that he gives feedback to. It's the story of a young Atlean living on a magical island in the Atlantic. His father, the Lord of Atlantis, is missing on his last assignment. So... Um, Alec has to spy on the new upstart Romans and then he finds a magical gold medallion at which point he has to go to the barbaric lands of Egypt, Babylon and Greece to discover the, the king and fight the Romans. My take on that? Yeah. Well, it's wickedly, wickedly expensive. It's a, you know, a $200 million movie to make. 
um, why someone's going to make that film that's not based on uh, some prior material that already has a fan base is highly unlikely. It would have to be such an unbelievably well executed script. Um, which is probably, not, it's not, that does not sound like the kind of calling card that a first time writer would want to do. It sounds like a very, very steep hill to climb. I would advise the writer to, to concentrate on something that, that has more of a chance of catching people's attention. This centers on a guy called James. He's a government worker and is diagnosed with terminal brain cancer. But at this point, he's hired by a government agency that tackles threats to national security. This agency, has the sole responsibility of protecting the public from a dangerous organisation researching the powers of mind control. And James discovers that this organisation has a serum that cures cancer, but can also unlock highly dangerous mind control potential. It's life and career. I've dealt with a lot of these subjects in films, you know. Um, this is very familiar terror to me. This is an execution uh, uh, dependent script. Um, uh, it needs to have a great starring part. It needs to be very well done. Um, it's a viable idea. It's to totally dependent on the execution. But again, I will. This there's a lot of things that are in there that are very common to a lot of different scripts, and some scripts that I know that are floating around. So the biggest problem for this writer is going to be that there's a lot of competition in a lot of the same areas that he's dealing with, and may well find that uh, you know goes to all the trouble to work this up, and 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 only to find out that there are other projects that are similar along the way um you know that that genre in particular i mean look what have i mean the success of taken for example the surprise effect of taken and 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 and, and the, the borns and all the there's a whole bunch of films in the pipeline that are sort of in that same tone so it's shaky territory but it's a totally viable idea a pair of female amateur ufo enthusiasts spend a weekend in the middle of nowhere they come across an unconscious naked man in the woods one evening after a suspected sighting and belief he's an alien. So What's the film rated? Oh, sorry, go ahead. They, said they believe that he's been sent to destroy mankind. The man, who's just a prank victim on a night owl, tries to convince the girls that to save their race, they must breed with him and create super beings. And then some aliens arrive. I like that idea. I like that idea. Um, it's, you know, it's cheap. Uh, it's castable cheap, you know, it's funny. I think, what's the title? It doesn't have a title. Yeah. All right, well, that may, my advice would to spend a lot, a lot of time on the title. That's an idea that could be pitched and conceivably sold to the right person. Um, uh, you know, low budget, teen alien comedy, why not? Okay. Yeah. So th there you go. What did um, Tony Gilroy, Oops, that's not, that's what we will have in a minute, not quite yet. So what are the elements that Tony Gilroy picked out? First one was budget, so wickedly expensive. Second one, he said, is execution dependent. You look up what that means. We dedicated a whole masterclass to that earlier in the season. He also said there are works in the pipeline that are similar. So he was aware of what is currently being in development. So you need to do that research as well. And finally, he fell for the third one, which had a strong hook. And I think those, those are valuable learnings from this high-level pitch feedback. We're about to wrap up. Any final questions outstanding? Yes, Sean. In your pitch that you did over in New Zealand, you said you didn't anticipate what you needed from him. Like, what would you, in hindsight, have asked for? Um, we would have specifically listed the services that where the workshop could have contributed to the film and the budget. We would then also have costed what the what we would have anticipated the, that that would have costed. Now, it, it, again, a testament to the the incredible um, uh, generosity of Richard Taylor at the time, he basically did that exercise for us right there. He basically said, for hearing from your pitch, you, you will need the creature created, you'll need uh, uh, props, you'll need costumes, you need mini miniatures. The cost of that is probably going to be, I, at that point, he gave it a ballpark of uh, $550,000 uh, Australia, uh, New Zealand, which would, at an, an ultra-low budget, be um, roughly between a third and half of our production budget. And um, he made us a proposal right there. 
and that w- I can tell you that was an offer that we couldn't refuse. So it was really up to us to to get the to get the project finance, and everything went really well. But our mistake was in not getting back early enough with the the finished screenplay or a revised screenplay. Because what we did, we pitched based on the next draft screenplay. We had a draft, but that draft didn't represent where we want to go, where we were going. And then it took another year before that draft was ready. And then the, the budget of that draft was, uh, was too high. And that's when I uh, stepped back as a producer. I left the project. Any other questions? All right, that's my, my turn to pitch then. Um, next week, we have our Hero's Journey session where I will show tons of clips in illustrating the key Hero's Journey stages. And uh, I always make an effort to not use those that you already see everywhere that you find in the book by Chris Fogler. I try to give it a, a somewhat uh, original spin. And then the week after that, first Friday of November, that's when I'm hoping that you will be present for our first masterclass of the next round. And we'll have topics such as adaptation, uh, taking notes from producers and writing for tone. The details are in the email that I uh, sent you. Just go to the masterclass uh, site. It gives you the price, $49 US for seven sessions. Plus, you get access to all recordings from the previous session that we just wrapped up last week when we talk about great antagonists. We had a, a few really, really cool sessions this time around. So that's all included in the $49 US if you sign up. You might want to try the full immersion uh, screenwriting writing course, which I'm a huge fan of, I'm very proud of that course. That includes those first seven uh, masterclasses as well. So all the details in, uh, or at least the links in the email I sent to you. And we're going to wrap up with the most requested video. You got a question, Rosemary? Carol, yeah, I wanted to yeah. share something that I thought that everyone might be interested in. Um, I was sitting on a round robin writing workshop, so I got to be on the other side of the table um, as a, a group of um, 39 producers and it was a writing workshop in Italy and I happened to be on the same table as a guy called Paul Brett who was one of the main financiers on the King's Speech and what he said to everyone who pitched was he said while you're pitching to me I am thinking about if I can work with you for the next five years. Now, you mentioned that a lot of people start arguing or trying to prove their point uh, to the person that they're pitching with. As soon as that happens, he, 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 he just thinks, no, nah, I'm not going to do it. So I thought that was really something um, incredible I never would have thought of, and he told that to every single person. So that's, um, I thought that would be very important to, to know. Yeah. The most requested video in all of my classes about uh, pitching is this one. So coming up this fall, we got a big push for some of our drama films. And as a studio, we are really looking for the River's Crest to be our main Oscar contender. I like that. I like the River's Crest. I want to say one quick thing, if I may. I would love it if we could push the current of the stream for Best Actress. Good. You guys are all here. You guys are the main guys. I want to pitch some movies to you guys real quick. I have some great movies I want to pitch to you guys. You guys are the heads of the studio, so that's good. Wait, whoa, 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 whoa. Who are you? My name's Scott. I just started working here at the studio today, and I have some really good movie ideas Scott, I need to pitch to you Scott, guys. Scott, Scott, where do you work here? Uh, in the mailroom. But I have some really good movies. I want to do this A movie. Movie idea. What? Sorry, Scott. That's not how we do this. No, no, just listen. I want to do this movie where this guy, he like breaks into the White House, and he's going around, and he's stealing everything. He's a big bag, and he's taking everything off the desk and putting it in the bag. And he goes in the Oval Office, and he's taking like ashtrays and lamps, and he's putting the bag and everything. Then all of a sudden, the Secret Service bursts in. They're like, freeze! Get down on the ground. You're under arrest for stealing from the president of the United States of America. And the guy just pulls off his mask and he's like, I am the president of the United States of America. And they're like, oh, snap. And he's like, you're fired. You're in a lot of trouble now, Scott. Yeah, a whole lot of yeah. trouble. Wait, wait, no, no, I have another movie I want to do where these guys, they have to go back in time to fight the dinosaurs because that's the only way they can get the antidote. So they go back in time to fight the dinosaurs and they shoot the dinosaurs, but the dinosaurs are bigger than they thought they were. So the dinosaurs are like, bing, bing, so what? And they're like, oh no. So they go to the main scientist guy. And the scientist guy's like, I think I know how to kill him. They're like, great. So they get the biggest, meanest dinosaur, the boss dinosaur. They get him on the edge of the cliff and they're like, okay, dinosaur, we know how to kill you now. Then all of a sudden, the dinosaur just steps off the cliff and he starts floating. And they're like, oh, snap. And he's like, yeah, all dinosaurs are space aliens. 
Sam, call security. Yes, right away. Wait, no, 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 no. So what you're saying, Scott, is that the dinosaurs are actually aliens. Yeah, but you don't find that until the very, very end of the movie. Then this other movie I want to do, when these guys are in a compound, this other guy comes in, he kicks open the door, like, and they're like, what's going on, what's going on? He's like, I got good news and I got bad news. They're like, what's the good news? He's like, the good news is, I checked it out, there's a whole lot of them out there, and they're bigger than us, and they have better guns than us, but I think I found a secret tunnel, so if we go right now, we can get away. And they're like, that's great, what's the bad news? And he's like, I'm the bad news. And they're like, oh, snap. That sounds like a Vin Diesel vehicle. Yeah, we've got him locked for a two more picture deal. Sam, get VD on the phone. Scott, more, go. Okay, I have another movie where it's about the biggest dam in the world and it's about to break and destroy all of New York and Los Angeles and they're like, everybody, Wait, Scott, Scott. Why is the dam gonna break? Because a satellite went crazy in space and it shot a hole in the ozone layer. So they're like, okay, everybody, get out of town, evacuate the, the planet. So everybody's in their cars and it's gridlock traffic. Then at the worst possible moment, the dam goes and this big wall of water comes down the street, knocks over the Empire State Building, knocks over the Eiffel Tower, and the wall of water is coming down the street. The camera zooms in on the back of a taxi cab, and Mel Gibson turns around and he goes, not again. And it goes, boom, boom, Mel Gibson, boom, boom, the dam, boom, boom, summer. Get Mel Gibson back into action. I really like it, Scott Morgo. Okay, I have another movie I want to do about all these cool black people that hang out in a driveway, and this car comes up, and they're like, who's that? And the windows come down, and green smoke comes out, and then Method Man and Red Man get out of the car, and they're like, oh, and then Queen Latifah comes up. She has that funny neck bob thing she does. It's really funny. And then all of a sudden, this big white fuzzy limo pulls up, and they're like, who's that? And the door opens, and Cedric the Entertainer comes out, and he has a really funny hat on, and it's called The Driveway. Yes! yes! The driveway! The driveway! The driveway! Of course it's called The Driveway, and that's going to get that demographic. Darren, what's that demographic? Black people. They're going to love that idea. Scott, you have saved the studio, and I thank you. Oh, thank you, and you got some mail. Oh. I'm hoping to see you guys next week. If not then, then for the first one in November. Thanks for joining. Have a great weekend. See you all. Bye-bye.